Okay, so uh, let us continue our discussion uh, in this class. So, um, just to refresh what we have done in the previous class, we derived a, a Tresca yield function, one minus yield function, and then we discussed about normality, convexity concepts. Okay, then um, we discussed about why hydrostatic stress does not influence the uh, yielding of metallic materials. Okay, so and then we solved uh, one small problem. Okay, so now uh, we will continue our discussion in this uh, section. Um, there are a couple of small topics that we have to complete uh, for this module. Okay, so uh, now before we uh, start our new uh, you know, heading, so this uh, one thing which you have to briefly discuss that is basically we derived this equation for 1 minus yield function uh, in the uh, previous section. Okay, so uh, this we derived in terms of uh, principal stresses. That is, whenever this equation is satisfied, that is square root of 1 by 2 into sigma 1 minus 2 the whole square, 2 minus 3 the whole square, and 3 minus 1 the whole square is equal to sigma f uniaxial flow strength, okay, or uniaxial yield stress. We say that material is going to yield, right. So, uh, this we derived in principal coordinate system, and now in general coordinate system for yielding to happen as per 1 minus yield function, this equation has to be satisfied, okay. This is just for our information. We have not derived it, but this will be useful for solving problems. Sigma 1 1 minus 2 to the whole square plus 2 2 minus 3 3 the whole square plus 3 3 minus 1 1 the whole square plus 6 into sigma 1 2 square plus 2 3 square plus 3 1 square that will be equal to 6 k square is equal to 2 a sigma f square. Okay, this is the actual uh, you know uh, equation for 1 minus yield function. Okay, when the left hand side of this equation equals to 6 k square where k is your uh, you know shear yield strength. Okay, and uh, then yielding will start. Okay, and the same left hand side is equal to 2 sigma f square where sigma f is your uniaxial uh, yield strength then yielding will start. So, that is the meaning of this equation and in this if you want to write the principal coordinate system then only the first part will come that is uh, 1 1 will become 1, 2 2 becomes 2, 3 3 becomes 3 and this equation one can derive. Right. So, this is a general equation which will be useful for solving some problems later on. Uh, maybe during assignments okay and uh, the k and sigma f has got same meaning like what we discussed in tresca yield function okay and the 6 k square is equal to 2 sigma f square will yield this particular relationship between k and sigma f okay so this is nothing but k equals uh, sigma f by square root of uh, 3 okay so uh, this relates uh, uh, shear yield strength to uniaxial yield strength and this is from one minus yield function. So, k is equal to sigma f by square root of 3. In Tresca yield function, I think we have uh, evaluated we got k is equal to sigma f by 2. Okay. So, depending on the yield function, the relationship between your shear yield strength and uniaxial yield, yield strength can change. Okay. So, with this uh, brief, we are going to next uh, important section for us that is called work of plastic deformation. Okay, so, how to get uh, work done during plastic deformation? Very briefly, we are discussing. Okay, suppose you take a principal element okay, of a unit side okay, and uh, in this uh, force acting on each face is shown okay, for a small uh, displacement okay, which is given by a small strain d epsilon 1. Okay. So, this is the initial one and this dotted one is basically the new dimension or the new uh, deformed element and all forces are shown here for a unit side. Okay. So, uh, since this is a principal element, uh, we already made a point that this is a principal element, we can directly write okay, the, um, uh, the work done per unit volume as sigma 1 d epsilon 1 plus sigma 2 d epsilon 2 plus sigma 3 d epsilon 3. Okay. And uh, if you want to get work done per unit volume, okay, uh, the absolute value, okay, you can integrate it and I have given an example for a plane stress process. Suppose if it is a plane stress as per our definition, okay, your sigma 3 will go off. Okay, then you will have sigma 1 d epsilon 1 plus sigma 2 d epsilon 2 and if you want work done per unit volume, you can integrate it between uh, 0 to epsilon 1 and then 0 to epsilon 2 which will give you this particular equation. And sigma 1, sigma 2 or one can have an equation for that as a function of uh, epsilon. Okay, so, now if you want to go for tensile test, okay, uh, you know, then we can say that sigma 2, sigma 3 will be 0 then only this fellow will exist. So, work done per unit volume is equal to 0 to epsilon 1 dW by uh, you know unit volumes and you can say 0 to epsilon 1 sigma 1 d epsilon 1. So, this is for a general principal element uh, the work done for deforming that element and uh, you can uh, minimize the uh, uh, problem to a plane stress problem that, that will become this 1 and 2 will exist. If it is uniaxial only 1 is going to exist 
and you can get. And we all know that this integral is nothing but area under the stress strain behavior, true stress strain behavior. Okay. Similarly, you can imagine that area under uh, this one also, this one together. Okay. Then it becomes a work done per unit volume in plane stress process. You will see that diagram now. So, this is basic for work done per uh, unit volume and uh, given a stress strain curve, we can get work done. I will show you an example when we work out a problem today at the end of this particular module. And there is something called as work hardening hypothesis, which is an uh, extension of this, you know, uh, how to get, uh, you know, work of plastic deformation. And uh, of course, I have given some introduction here. So, okay. So, but as per work hardening hypothesis, okay. We can say that it has been found by experiment that flow stress increases in any process according to the amount of plastic work done during this process. Correct, that is known. But the main point is okay, in two different processes, okay, if the work done in each is the same, okay, the flow stress end of the process will be same regardless of the stress path. This statement is true for monotonic process. Monotonic process we already discussed, monotonic process means keep on increasing, strain keeps on increasing. So, in two different processes, if the work done in each is the same. Okay. Suppose you have uniaxial tensile test, you have another plane stress process. We can say that these two are two different processes. If work done is in each is the same, okay, then flow stress are going to be the same at these two uh, process at that particular stage. That is what is uh, uh, the hypothesis about. Okay. You can uh, describe these two schematically. Okay. Let us pick up an element deforming uniaxial uh, tensile deformation in this way. Huh? This is a typical uh, sigma versus epsilon graph and you can see red color curve is the stress strain behavior and I am picking up a point here up to one particular epsilon. Let us say maybe epsilon 1 okay, or epsilon. So, the area under this I am going to indicate it as work done in uniaxial tensile test. Suppose you have a, a, an element, principal element which is deforming in plane stress okay, like work done we have shown before. Then you will have two sigmas. One is sigma 1 varying with respect to let us say epsilon 1 and there is a sigma 2 varying with respect to epsilon 2 you can say in general x axis is epsilon, then you will have two curves separately, sigma 1 going in this in this way and sigma 2 going in this way and they can be related, sigma 2 and sigma 1 can be related like we have discussed before. Okay. So, if this is the case, we can say that according to work hardening hypothesis, the flow stress at the end of the process, this plane stress process, we do not know what is it, end of the process is given by tensile test curve, this curve, when an equal amount of plastic work has been done. Okay. That means, when the sum of the areas in the above figure in this figure is equal to the area under the tensile test curve, okay, then you can get uh, uh, you know uh, the work done being same in both the cases, you can get uh, flow stress at the end of this plane stress process when compared to uniaxial. This is what is called as uh, your work hardening hypothesis. Okay, anyway, these are two small sections which we want to discuss here, but then let us go to an important section just to complete this module and let us do some problems. Okay, this is actually called as effective strain and effective stress. So, uh, effective stress is generally referred as sigma bar and effective strain is generally referred as epsilon bar. This is the way we write this. Okay. And this uh, sigma bar uh, effective stress is also called as equivalent stress, effective strain is also called as equivalent strain, different names for that. Okay. And uh, for any yield function you choose, okay, let us say for example, 1 minus or any other equation that may derive later on, there is going to be one equation for sigma bar, we can derive another equation for epsilon bar. And uh, as we know that for Tresca and von Mises, these are meant for isotropic materials. Okay, that means R is equal to one. So we don't have any R values in this equation. Okay, then we can derive sigma bar for von Mises material and epsilon bar for von Mises material. They will have different equations. Okay, and the sigma bar and epsilon bar can also be related by any strain hardening law. Okay, but actually, if you want to derive sigma bar, okay, let us say for von Mises equation. Okay, one minus material. Sorry. Okay, we have already uh, derived this equation in this way, in one way, which is we are going to report it. Okay, in that way. That's all. Okay, so sigma bar has been already derived for one minus equation in the, in the in the previous section, and we are just going to name that equation for sigma bar. That's all we are going to do. But then we derive epsilon bar separately for one minus materials. So we know that when yielding occurs during plastic deformation, uh, during deformation, we can write, okay, by one minus function. This function is nothing but square root of 1 minus alpha plus alpha square into sigma 1. Okay. So, this is for plane stress case. Correct. This is for plane stress case. I hope you understand this. Okay. Sigma 3 is not there in this equation. Okay. Plane stress 
okay means uh, it is a function of uh, sigma 1 and uh, sigma 2 sigma 1 comma sigma 2 sigma 3 is not there so naturally alpha comes into picture so we have this equation square root of 1 minus alpha plus alpha square into sigma 1 okay this function itself is actually called as effective stress or equivalent stress sigma bar and if the material is going to yield then this equation will be equal to flow stress then equation will be equal to flow stress okay so that is all. So sigma bar we have already derived it. Only thing is we are just naming it here as this equation as effective stress equation for one masses material and the sigma bar when it becomes sigma f we say that the material is going to yield. Okay. So the same equation this equation we have seen in the previous slide we have seen in the previous slide the same equation here this equation okay, we are just going to name it as sigma bar that is all. Okay. So, sigma bar is equal to square root of 1 by 2 into sigma 1 minus 2 the whole square plus sigma 2 minus 3 the whole square plus 3 minus 1 the whole square. We can just directly write this as sigma bar. When the sigma bar equals sigma f, we say material is going to yield. Okay. In plain stress, this can be written. Okay. Same equation, we are just naming it as sigma bar is equal to square root of 1 minus alpha plus alpha square into sigma 1, where alpha is nothing but your sigma 2 by sigma 1, nothing but your uh, stress ratio. If a material is at yield, this function will have magnitude of a flow, any axial flow stress that is sigma f or yield strength, okay, so which is known to us. Okay, so, there is no separate uh, derivation for sigma bar. Sigma bar is already derived for one masses material and we are just uh, naming it here. If somebody asks us what is the sigma bar for effective stress for one masses uh, or uh, derived from one masses equation for one masses materials means then you can tell any one of this. In uh, general state of stress but in principal coordinate system this is the thing. In plane stress this is the thing we can directly uh, write this to okay sigma bar is equal to this that means uh, if you know alpha and sigma 1 or if you know sigma 1 sigma 2 or sigma 3 then you can just simply substitute here and uh, you will get effective stress when this effective stress if the magnitude is equal to the flow stress of the material or yield strength of the material you can say material is going to yield okay so now let us come for effective strain okay equation or equivalent strain equation you can also derive effective strain increment and of course you have to integrate it to get the absolute value for this we need to derive it okay so that's a there's a small derivation here so uh, for this what we are going to uh, write the first equation as this equivalent of uh, you know principle of equivalent work done okay we are saying that the plastic work done in 1d would be equal to plastic work done in a general state and uh, this equation can be written sigma bar d epsilon bar is nothing but plastic work done in effective terms that will be equal to this you already we have written the work done during deformation is given as sigma 1 d epsilon 1 plus sigma 2 d epsilon 2 plus sigma 3 d epsilon 3. In integral notation, we have not discussed this, this is for you to understand, this can be written in this way okay, and this can also be written at sigma dot d epsilon. Okay. So now what we are going to do is, we are going to let us say pick up these two, okay. we are going to pick up let us say uh, the first and next part let us say okay you are sigma bar d epsilon bar and this one we can simply say d epsilon bar okay why we need d epsilon bar on left hand side because that is the equation we have to get we have to actually get equation for d epsilon bar so that you can get an equation for epsilon bar right like we have sigma bar equation you need to get an equation for this only that is why what we are saying d epsilon bar will be equal to sigma ij divided by sigma bar into d epsilon ij. Uh, sigma ij divided by sigma bar is into d epsilon ij will give me d epsilon bar and uh, this d epsilon ij is nothing but uh, plastic strain increment is given by your normal decondition which you have discussed in the previous section. So, sigma ij divided by sigma bar into this I am going to write it as uh, dou f by dou sigma ij into d lambda and this is what f is what I informed you as a yield function okay. and sigma ij is nothing but the individual element in the tensor and d lambda is an arbitrary constant. Okay. This equation can also be written as d epsilon bar is equal to 1 by sigma bar into sigma 1 d epsilon 1 plus sigma 2 d epsilon 2 plus sigma 3 d epsilon 3 from equivalent work done and in this I can get this equation we will come to this little later in the next slide probably we will use this equation now. So, 1 by sigma bar into sigma 1 d epsilon 1 plus sigma 2 d epsilon 2 plus sigma 3 d epsilon 3 and I want to put strain increments to get strain increments here. Okay, so, that I can rewrite sigma 1, 2 and 3 in terms of d epsilon 1, 2 and 3 so that the entire equation becomes as a function of strain increments only. Okay. So, whenever I want to get relationship between principal stresses and strain increment, I need to go for normality condition. 
Okay, or I can get it from this part also, normality equation also you can get. But then here we are going to use uh, your levi meisser's equation, levi meisser's floor. Both can be used. Okay, so now my root is going to be this. I need to get equation for d epsilon 1, 2 and 3 and rewrite that in terms of sigma 1, 2 and 3. Okay, I can substitute here and then okay, everything will be in terms of strain increment. So, what I am going to do? I am going to write d epsilon 1 is equal to 2 sigma 1 minus 2 minus 3 divided by 3 into d lambda. Right. So, this equation I think we already derived with respect to uh, your levi meisser's equation where the ratio of strain increment to deuteric stresses is going to be a constant. Right. So, my d epsilon 1 is equal to uh, you know your sigma dash into d lambda by into, into d lambda. Right. And then I can write uh, if d epsilon 1 means sigma 1 dash, sigma 1 dash is nothing but 2 sigma 1 minus 2 minus 3 divided by 3 into d lambda. Right. Similarly, d epsilon 2 is nothing but uh, 2 sigma 2 minus sigma 1 minus 3 divided by 3 into d lambda and d epsilon 3 is nothing but 2 sigma 3 minus sigma 1 minus 2 divided by 3 into d lambda. Right. So, this we can uh, uh, obtain from your uh, levi meisser's equation also, okay, which relates. Uh, so, d epsilon 1 is nothing but let us say sigma 1 dash into d lambda we can write, sigma 1 dash, yes. And this can be change depending on whether you want to find 1, 2 or 3, you will have sigma 2 dash and 3 dash which can be written here. Okay. So, now what I am going to do is uh, I am going to little bit uh, adjust these two. So, d epsilon 2 minus 3, okay. so 2 minus 3, okay. then uh, your 2, 2 will 1, 1, 1 and 1 will go, then you will have sigma 2 minus sigma 3 into d lambda and then 1 minus 3 will give me sigma 1 minus uh, sigma 3 into d lambda like small adjustments I am going to do here to get something which will be useful for me to rewrite it later on. So, now what I am going to do in the next step is d epsilon bar is equal to 1 by sigma bar into sigma 1 d epsilon 1 plus sigma 2 d epsilon 2. Uh, in the previous equation I have written sigma 3 d epsilon 3. Now, d epsilon 3 I am going to rewrite this in terms of 1 and 2, in terms of 1 and 2. So, for that I am going to write it in this way. Okay this will become minus d epsilon 3 would be equal to minus of d epsilon 1 plus 2. So, I am going to get minus here, these two is going to be added within the brackets. right? So, this equation can be rewritten in this form, this all will remain same. Now, you have d epsilon 1, d epsilon 1, d epsilon 2, d epsilon 2, I can uh, take d epsilon 1 and 2 outside and I can write like this. Only for this reason in the previous slide, I have got sigma 1 and sigma 3, sigma 2 minus sigma 3, okay, which I got it in this way sigma 2 minus 3 is already there, sigma 1 minus 3 is already there. So, I am going to substitute for these two, okay, so that everything will come in the form of increment, strain increment. So, what I am going to do, d epsilon bar is equal to 1 by sigma bar in place of sigma 1 minus 3, I am going to write d epsilon 1 minus 3 divided by d lambda and in place of this, I am going to write this, d lambda will be common in the denominator. Okay. So, d epsilon bar is equal to 1 by sigma bar into d lambda, this entire thing this entire thing can be returned in this way. You can just do a small calculation, you should be able to get this. d epsilon 1 square plus 2 square plus 3 square. Okay. So, this is the equation actually I need. Okay. This is the equation I need okay. because sigma bar can be found out. d lambda is an arbitrary value, a constant and all these strain increments can be obtained from new and original dimensions. But there is one problem that this d lambda is actually undefined. Now, I want to remove it when I am going to remove it, I can also remove sigma bar, uh, you know, in one way so that this entire equation will be a function of strains only or strain increments only. So, what I am going to do is, I am going to replace sigma bar d epsilon with a d, uh, d lambda with a d epsilon term. So, for that what I am going to do is, I am going to go back to my previous uh, derivation that is uh, d epsilon bar is equal to 1 by sigma bar into, okay. So, uh, sigma 1 into d epsilon 1, is not it? sigma 1 to d epsilon 1. So, in place of d epsilon 1, I am going to substitute here, d epsilon 2 I am going to substitute here, d epsilon 3 I am going to substitute here. Okay. So, that I am getting 1 by sigma bar into sigma 1 into 2 sigma 1 minus 2 minus 3 divided by 3 into d lambda, then this one will, this term will come, then my this term will come. Okay. So, now what will happen? d lambda by 3 is uh, common. So, and then I am going to take it here uh, and then what I can do is sigma bar and 3 is in denominator, it will come in numerator here. So, my 3 sigma bar d epsilon bar divided by d lambda can be written. So, d lambda when it comes to left hand side, it will be denominator. So, I can write 3 sigma bar 
d epsilon bar divided by d lambda okay what is remaining remaining is going to be this okay this okay and my this isn't it so which can if you rewrite it you will get it in a very useful form sigma 1 minus 2 whole square plus sigma 2 minus 3 whole square plus 3 minus 1 the whole square which is nothing but our 2 sigma bar square which is what we have seen in the previous section right this one so 2 sigma bar square uh, 2 sigma bar square would be equal to uh, sigma 1 minus 2 the whole square 2 minus 3 the whole square 3 minus 1 the whole square right so which is what i am going to get here which is nothing but 2 sigma bar square. So, now what I am going to do, I want to remove sigma bar d epsilon bar, right? So, or in terms, I want to remove d lambda. So, d lambda can be related to sigma bar in this way. So, I can write d lambda as nothing but uh, your 3 d epsilon bar divided by 2 sigma bar. Sigma bar, sigma 1 sigma bar will go away. Then 3 by 2 into d epsilon, d epsilon bar divided by sigma bar would be my d lambda. So, I am going to substitute this into this equation, okay? So, that we can do little bit more steps and then finally, you arrive at d epsilon bar equation. So, I have written here 1 minus effective, sorry, this is 1 minus effective stress equation, 1 minus effective stress equation, okay. So, now what I am going to do, put d lambda and d lambda in d epsilon bar equation, d epsilon bar is equal to 2 sigma bar divided by uh, 3 into sigma bar d epsilon bar into this entire equation. I am going to write as it is. So, in place of d lambda, I am going to write 3 d epsilon bar divided by 2 sigma bar okay which will give me very nice this particular equation and uh, you will see that sigma bar sigma bar will be cancelled the d epsilon bar will go in the left hand side it will become square so square root will come square root of 2 by 3 into d epsilon 1 square plus 2 square plus 3 square this is my useful equation for effective strain increment incremental effective strain equation for one masses material okay so i can get epsilon bar from this directly I can get epsilon bar from this directly which is what is I have written here. Okay. So, you will see that it is nothing but square root of 2 by 3 into absolute values epsilon 1 square plus 2 square plus 3 square. Okay. It is integrated appropriately and I know beta. Now, what is beta? I can write it in terms of the same equation in terms of beta epsilon 2 divided by epsilon 1 and uh, uh, though this is a plain stress process what we are discussing here 3 also exists inside these two. Uh, when you speak about 1 and 2 there is a 3 inside. Okay, there is 3 inside 1 and 2 okay, uh, because of volume constancy. Okay, so, now what I am going to do? I am going to rewrite this entire equation in terms of beta but epsilon 1 will come into this equation outside the square root. Okay. So, what you need to do is basically you need to uh, replace uh, your epsilon 1, 2 and 3 in terms of beta. So, you can substitute beta here and see whether you get the previous equation epsilon 2 divided by epsilon 1. You can just check this so that whether you get this equation or not, you can find out. Okay. So, what we got is basically, this is one equation, this is another equation which will be useful for us. And again, if you see that epsilon bar is equal to square root of 2 by 3 into epsilon 1 square plus 2 square plus 3 square. If you want to rewrite this in terms of beta, it is square root of 4 by 3 into 1 plus beta plus beta square into epsilon 1. Epsilon 1 should come outside the square root. You can just derive it and check. Okay. And uh, you will see that uh, all these values 1, 2 and 3 can be obtained from the original and new dimensions of the uh, you know during deformation and also if you know what is beta, okay, how is it related you can get uh, epsilon bar. Okay. Uh, the same equation can be written in general coordinate system like this. This is just for you to know. Okay. So, d epsilon bar is equal to again square root of 2 by 3 into 1, 1 square, 2, 2 square, 3, 3 square and then 2 d epsilon 1 2 square 1 3 square and 2 3 square that will come anyway so we are generally we see in principle coordinate system uh, these two forms these two forms will be more useful for us to solve problems okay so now given one minus uh, your uh, yield function given one minus uh, yield function we derived a sigma bar equation and epsilon bar equation similarly if you want to go for any other yield function you have such equations okay so now some uh, small uh, node points okay so what will happen let us see okay for a tensile test okay we know in axial tensile test we know that 2 and 3 would be 0 and you have sigma 1 not equal to 0 so if you see if we substitute that in this equation uh, in your sigma bar equation okay where is that equation let us say for example here okay or uh, this equation you can directly substitute it okay 2 will go off 3 will go off then this fellow will go this fellow will go uh, you know 2 sigma 2 2 will be cancelled sigma bar equal to sigma 1 
okay for any axle tensile test if you put the condition as sigma 1 exists 2 1 3 does not exist then this will go this part will go this small part will go then you will have sigma 1 square here also sigma 1 square 2 times 2 2 will be cancelled so sigma bar is equal to sigma 1 okay so this is one important result so effective stress is nothing but your uniaxial uh, principle uh, you know first principle stress sigma 1 when you go for uniaxial tensile test so sigma 1 is equal to sigma bar is equal to sigma 1 this can be asked as a proof prove that sigma bar is equal to sigma 1 uniaxial tensile test means you should be able to derive this wherein you can say the material is considered isotropic and follow one masses equation then you put this uh, conditions in sigma bar equation you should be able to get this the same thing if you want to get d epsilon bar or epsilon bar equation that also can be done so in a tensile test you have all three strains epsilon 1 will be there okay 2 and 3 will also be there but they are not equal okay they are not equal how they are related they are related by this and we also said that beta is equal to i think uh, minus 1 by 2 for any axial tensile test isn't it beta is equal to minus 1 by 2 i think that we derived in the uh, previous section so you can see that d epsilon 2 by d epsilon 1 is equal to minus 1 by 2 so d epsilon 1 is equal to minus 2 d epsilon 2 if d epsilon 1 is minus 2 d epsilon 2 then this will be equal to minus of 2 times d epsilon 3 which you can get from your volume constancy equation okay if this is the case then you can substitute this in the uh, d epsilon bar equation in this uh, fashion suppose you go to this equation okay in place of d epsilon 1 square you substitute d epsilon 2 you can substitute d epsilon 3 you can substitute you can you know all these values so you will get this d epsilon bar is equal to square root of 2 by 3 into d epsilon 1 square will remain same in place of d epsilon 2 square i am going to put this d epsilon 1 square by 4 in place of d epsilon 3 square i am going to put this okay so what will i get d epsilon 1 square divided by 4 square root so this is 1 1 by 4 this is 1 by 2 1 by 2 plus 1 3 by 2 so 2 by 3 into 3 by 2 d epsilon 1 square 3 by 2 2 by 3 will be cancelled so square root will get cancelled out so d epsilon bar is equal to d epsilon 1 okay so i can write this equation sigma is equal to k epsilon power n as sigma bar is equal to k epsilon bar power n okay by using these two important results sigma is equal to k epsilon power n is a standard uh, equation that we know that we can describe in describe the strain hardening behavior of any metallic material uh, okay power law using power law type that can be written in the effective quantities the effective quantities in effective terms as sigma bar is equal to k epsilon bar power n okay by considering uniaxial deformation okay so by these two important results by these two important results okay and uh, for other yield functions there will be a different equation for epsilon bar but again there are also you can relate it to epsilon 1 epsilon 2 and epsilon 3 okay your sigma bar can be related to sigma 1 sigma 2 and uh, sigma 3 it could be any yield function okay then you can find epsilon 1 2 and 3 and substitute it here okay and by knowing k and n you can get sigma bar by knowing sigma bar and by knowing alpha you can get sigma 1 2 and 3 if it is a plain stress it becomes more easy for you because by knowing sigma bar okay uh, you have some equation relating sigma bar to sigma 1 sigma 2 that is what your real function is going to do so then by knowing sigma bar by knowing alpha you can get sigma 1 and sigma 2 okay say for example if you want to get a epsilon bar for one masses equation so epsilon bar for one masses equation you can use this by knowing beta okay you can substitute here get epsilon bar okay you substitute in this equation okay k n n you know how to find out for uniaxial tensile test you can get sigma bar if you know sigma bar there is one sigma 1 sigma 2 which causes the sigma bar that can also be found out by knowing uh, alpha by knowing alpha right because we already related a sigma bar to sigma 1 and alpha isn't it we already related these two so from this we can get sigma bar so that is how the entire thing is going to get related so one last information last uh, slide which we will see before uh, uh, solving this problem okay so now when we say effective stress okay what do you mean by effective stress and how are they related to yield locus is what is given in this uh, diagram okay so whenever you draw a graph between sigma 1 and sigma 2 it means that we are going to draw yield locus in the subject okay so uh, the black one is the initial yield locus you can imagine okay and then this blue and uh, red ones are basically updated yield locus because of strain hardening they are going to evolve in this uh, way in this way okay only thing is uh, we are saying the shape is same size is increasing simple this is the simplest way to model 
okay shape is same okay it is ellipse okay and size is increasing because of strain hardening so flow stress keeps on increasing in this way okay and this von meiser's uh, yield function effective stress uh, you know you know this right so 2 sigma bar square is equal to sigma 1 minus 2 the whole square 2 minus 3 the whole square and 3 minus 1 the whole square this is what we derived for effective stress for von meiser's equation and uh, this 2 sigma bar square in general you can say as k or you can leave it also this 2 sigma bar square signifies something called size of the yield locus and the right side of this equation tells something called the shape of the yield locus okay so this sigma bar or 2 sigma bar square in general you just call it as k or any other alphabet you want you put it means that it is going to define size of the yield locus size of the yield locus is defined by the magnitude of sigma bar or magnitude of uh, sigma bar that's why i written here as uh, the black one is connected to sigma 1 bar this blue one is connected to sigma 2 bar red one is connected to sigma 3 bar and another yield locus sigma 4 bar 5 bar which means that uh, sigma 1 bar 2 bar 3 bar are connected to each yield locus okay and the sigma 1 bar 2 bar 3 bar as denoted by one mass effective stress equation is going to be a function of sigma 1 2 and 3 and if sigma 3 is 0 in this diagram it is a function of sigma 1 and 2 or it is a function of alpha and sigma 1 okay and further deformation sigma 1 and 2 may increase and you will get sigma 2 bar and then your sigma 3 bar that is the way it is going to work and the right hand side of the equation which is going to tell the form of the equation will decide the shape of the yield locus if this form changes then the shape of the yield locus will also change okay suppose in place of 2 okay i am putting let us say m m is a variable depending on the material okay depending on the material m is going to be a variable let us say okay then i have chance of changing the shape of the yield locus okay when compared to the one mass yield locus okay so right now let us say this is a 2 it's not a problem okay so in that case we are going to have one particular shape of yield locus so this equation has got that meaning okay so what are we going to say a single number sigma bar okay one value in conjunction with the form of the yield surface or yield locus form of the yield surface or yield locus means this right hand side okay provides all such combinations of one state okay that means if you take sigma 1 bar okay that is obtained because of one particular value of sigma 1 2 and 3 and that is going to define one particular state that is a black color one okay it may be initial yielding or it can be this blue one further further deformation or red one further deformation like that. that is one information second one whereas all values are sigma bar all values are sigma bar sigma 1 bar 2 bar 3 bar represent set of allowable yield functions at various state okay in the first stage this is allowed in the next stage this is allowed in the next stage 3 is allowed okay so one diagram okay one yield locus diagram with the three curves for example black blue and red will tell you this two sets of information okay first st set is connected to one state okay sigma 1 bar that is given by sigma 1 2 and 3 and uh, if you come if you have a combination of sigma 1 bar 2 bar 3 bar it is going to tell you different stages of deformation causing that particular uh, you know deformation okay so size of the yield locus and shape of the yield locus is going to provide you this many information to you a single number sigma bar in conjunction with the form of the yield surface or yield locus provide all such combinations in one state whereas all values of sigma bar sigma 1 2 and 3 represent set of allowable yield functions at various state okay so one state and various state how do you define is by this equation that's the meaning of uh, this okay so now what we will do is uh, we will uh, solve a couple of problems uh, so that uh, um, we understand uh, what is uh, you know application of uh, whatever we discussed in this particular uh, section so let us pick up this particular problem i think this we already solved ah, so problem one two three few problems we already solved in the previous chapter ah, this all we solved let us go to okay this problem sheet deformation process correct let us go to sheet deformation process so what is the first question uh, question is a square element 8 by 8 mm in an undeformed sheet of 0.8 mm thickness becomes a rectangle 6.5 into 9.4 mm after deformation okay and the material stress strain law okay is uh, given by this particular equation okay sigma bar is equal to see we started writing in effective format okay sigma bar is equal to 
600 into 0 0.008 plus epsilon bar power 0 0.22 mega Pascal. Okay. So, uh, a square element we say 8 by 8 mm. Okay. So, 8 by 8 mm is going to become okay, uh, a rectangular element of this particular dimension. So, whenever you say rectangular element, okay, larger value will go to length, is not it? 9.4 and this will be given by 6.5. So, basically you are pulling it on one side, say for example. So, it gets compressed on the other side. So, 8 becomes 6.5, 8 becomes 9.4. Sheet thickness is already provided, initial sheet thickness is provided to you. Okay. So, now uh, the question is uh, and the stresses normal to the sheet is 0. Okay. So, as usual we say sigma 3 is equal to 0 which is easy for us to understand now what type of equations to use. So, you have to find several parameters in this. You need to find membrane stresses which means principal stresses basically sigma 1, sigma 2, 3 is anyway 0. Okay, fine. So, you have to get uh, sigma 1, sigma 2, final thickness that is T, uh, T naught is given, this is your T naught. Okay, T has to be found. The principal strains, we know epsilon 1, comma epsilon 2, comma epsilon 3. Again, I am cautioning here, sigma 3 is equal to 0, does not mean that epsilon 3 is equal to 0, unless otherwise something else is mentioned. You have to be careful, all 3 will exist. Okay. So, you should also get stress and strain ratios that means alpha and beta has to be found out okay. and hydrostatic stress let us say sigma h. Of course, you know when you have uh, sigma h it will automatically come to dewatrix stresses that is uh, maybe I will say sigma 1 dash, 2 dash and uh, 3 dash and plastic work done. Okay. So, work done per unit volume or work done you need to get. These are the things you have to get as output. Okay, so, now how are we going to proceed? So, whenever dimensions are given, okay, whenever dimensions are given okay, uh, in the undeformed sheet and the deformed sheet, the first job is to find the strains. That is the way it has to go. Okay. So, either if dimensions are not given, strains are, strains are given, then directly you can use strain. Otherwise, if dimensions, original new dimensions are given, the main uh, you know, source point is to get the strains first. Uh, if, if you go by any other route, you will not be able to solve this problem. Okay. So, now what I am going to do is uh, I am slowly scrolling down and uh, I am going to get epsilon 1, epsilon 2 and epsilon 3. I am going to get epsilon 1, 2 and 3. So, what is epsilon 1? As per original dimension, epsilon 1 is uh, uh, 1, see 1 is along this, okay. 1 is this, 2 is this, 3 is perpendicular to the sheet, okay. So, 1 is ln of 9.4, natural logarithm 9.4 divided by 8 uh, because it is true strain, no? ln of 9.4 divided by 8, you can check it, it will be 0 0.161. Epsilon 2 is uh, this fellow, okay, ln of uh, new dimension that is 6.5 divided by 8, uh, which is nothing but it will be in negative quantity minus of 0 0.208 or 0 0.21 you can keep. Okay. Two strains are found out, epsilon 1 and uh, epsilon 2. Epsilon 1 is, uh, is with respect to your 9.4 and epsilon 2 is with respect to 6.5, that you have to be a little bit careful. Okay. Then epsilon 3 can be found out from minus of epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 and from this you can get the thickness, new thickness. Okay. From this you can get new thickness. That means now epsilon 1 is found out, 2 is found out, 3 can be found out from this equation. Okay. So, 3 equations can be obtained. Okay. If the epsilon 3 is known, then epsilon 3 is nothing but ln of t divided by t naught. Right. So, that will give you t naught is 0 0.8. So, that will give you t. That is one route to follow. The other route what you can follow is you can use this equation. L into w into t would be equal to L naught w naught t naught that will be equal to the same, the same equation. So, initial volume is this, the initial volume is this of that element, is not it? So, 8 into 8 into thickness of that is how much? Thickness of that is 0 0.8, is not it? So, 8 into 8 into 0 0.8 would be equal to 6.5 into 9.4 into new thickness t, from this t you can, uh, you know from this equation you can get t is equal to 0 0.838 mm. If you use this, then also you will get near about 0 0.838 mm or 0 0.84 mm. Either way you can use, okay, you can find out, it is not a problem, okay. So, uh, uh, if you do not want to follow this, then if you are following this, from this you can get find epsilon t, epsilon t is equal to ln of uh, new thickness that is uh, 0. 838 divided by 0 0.8 that will give you thickness strain or epsilon 3. 
okay, or epsilon 3. Either way you can find out. Okay. So, one important observation before we go ahead, okay, you will see the sheet thickness which is initially 0 0.8 has become 0 0.838. Okay. Initially sheet thickness is 0 0.8. Okay. Let us say this is 0 0.8 mm. Okay. That has become 0 0.838 mm which is actually a little bit increased. Okay. But generally what we understand from whatever we discussed is generally thickness has to reduce you know, because material deform. When you pull it in one direction, we expect width and thickness to decrease. But here you should note down this thickness is slightly increased. Okay. We will see that later on, but I am just giving you an observation. Fine. So now epsilon 1, 2, 1, 3 are obtained okay, and thickness is also obtained. Okay. If epsilon 1 and 2 are known, you can get beta from this equation epsilon 2 by epsilon 1 which is nothing but minus 0 0.280 by divided by 0 0.161 which is nothing but minus 1.29. Okay. If beta is known to you, beta is a negative value uh, here. So, beta is known to you, you can get alpha okay, by 2 beta plus 1 divided by 1 plus beta and I think you understand how when did we relate this alpha and beta? We related with Revy-Meyers flow rule. Okay. The same equation which you used previously no, to solve that effective strain equation to derive effective strain equation in that the end result one of the end result of Levy-Meyers equation is to relate alpha and beta. I am just reminding you the, so you get alpha is equal to 2 beta plus 1 by divided by 2 plus beta. This equation is going to be used predominantly in this course. So, beta is known to you minus of uh, 1.29 you substitute here you will get alpha as 2.225 or you can say minus 2.23. Okay. So, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3, uh, new and new thickness alpha beta all are obtained now okay so what is the root root we followed is from original and new dimensions you get epsilon 1 and 2 from that you can get epsilon 3 okay if epsilon 3 is known you get a t okay oh sorry alpha is not found out alpha is not found out okay you got a t okay so then from t okay or from uh, the initial and original dimensions you can get t and then you can get epsilon 3 either way is fine so by knowing epsilon 1 and 2 you got beta and from beta actually you got alpha this is the best route to get any other route you will stop in between you will not be able to solve okay so anyway so now uh, uh, once your uh, strains are found out uh, the best choice for you is find out beta and from beta you got alpha now you know like uh, what you can do is basically you need to get uh, uh, your membrane stresses because your alpha is known. Okay, If alpha is known, you can get sigma 1 and sigma 2. 3 is anyway not there, it is becoming 0 here. But there is one issue. If you want to get sigma 1 and sigma 2, at least you know you should have only any, only any one of these values you should know. Only then you can use alpha to get another one. Okay, Or what you need to know is if you know alpha, you should get sigma bar Okay, you should get sigma bar. So, by knowing alpha and sigma bar, you can get sigma 1 from, from 1 minus equation. Okay. Then you can get sigma 2 because alpha is known. The sigma bar is also not known to us. Okay. Only thing is sigma bar and equation is provided that is nothing but sigma bar is equal to 600 0 0.008 plus epsilon bar power 0 0.22. Okay. So, what we are going to do is this equation can be for used to find out sigma bar. Okay. And from sigma bar, you can get sigma 1 is known by knowing alpha, you can get sigma 2. That is the route we are going to follow. And uh, if you want to get epsilon bar here, we are going to use epsilon 1, epsilon 2 and epsilon 3, which we already know. Okay. And uh, before we go for calculation, I just want to focus on the form of this equation. This equation we have not studied until now. We have studied 600 epsilon power 0 0.22. That much we know sigma bar is equal to we studied k epsilon bar power n. Okay, but here we are going to add one more part to it. Okay, 0 0.008 that is a small value which is called as pre strain. That is called as pre strain. What is the significance of that we will see in the next uh, section. But uh, the flow stress model effective stress equation relating it to effective strain the form is different now. Anyway, so now what we are going to do is we are going to find effective strain. This equation is known to you we derived just now square root of 4 by 3 into 1 plus beta plus beta square into epsilon 1. Epsilon 1 should be outside the square root. Then uh, you substitute all the values. Beta is known to you. Beta is known to you. Epsilon 1 is known to you. You just now found out as uh, 0 0.161. If you substitute here, you should get 0 0.128. If epsilon bar is known, okay, then from the uh, effective stress, effective strain equation, that power law which already given you, okay, you can substitute it 
here in place of epsilon bar you should get 0 0.218 substitute here you should get sigma bar as 432.57 megapascal or 432.6 megapascal you can keep okay so sigma bar in this now can be obtained by using this relationship for that epsilon bar has to be known and epsilon bar depends on epsilon 1 2 and 3 which actually depends on the new and original dimensions that's all so if a sigma bar is known so i can write this 1 minus effective stress equation which is nothing but sigma bar is equal to sigma 1 into square root of 1 minus alpha plus alpha square that i already know ah, i think we have used this before also isn't it so in that powerpoint slide we i think we have used it okay so uh, you can use this equation so sigma bar is known to you already this is this is the value okay so now what we are going to do is uh, we can substitute this sigma bar equation we can substitute this uh, sigma bar equation and uh, we are going to use uh, we are going to use uh, this particular uh, you know sigma bar uh, values known to me divided by square root of 1 minus alpha plus alpha square alpha is found out you can substitute it you can get uh, 151.3 if sigma 1 is known alpha is known i can get uh, sigma 2 and uh, sigma 1 as minus 333.6 megapascal so alpha is known here sigma 1 is also known to me i can find out okay so now uh, there are two more uh, steps to it okay so which we are going to derive now so uh, how are we going to derive it we will see now so uh, yes so uh, now your alpha and uh, sigma 1 or alpha sigma 1 is known then sigma 2 can be found out that is also done okay now we are going to the next one that is your hydrostatic part okay so your hydrostatic part uh, so your hydrostatic stress is nothing but sigma 1 plus 2 plus 3 divided by 3 okay so sigma 1 is known to you 2 is known to you 3 is 0 right so which you have found out previously only sigma 1 is 151.3 2 is minus 336.6 sigma 3 is 0 divided by 3 should give you this one has to be very very careful here many times we do mistake that if sigma 3 is 0 then sigma 1 plus 2 divided by 2 is not correct okay the definition holds good okay sigma even if sigma 3 is 0 okay sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 divided by 3 okay you can substitute the values appropriately and then you will get a minus 61.7 mpa if sigma h is known then we can get deviatoric stresses sigma 1 dash is nothing but sigma 1 minus sigma h sigma 1 is this minus of minus this you will get this sigma 2 dash is sigma 2 minus sigma h you should get this and sigma 3 dash would be this okay and here also you will see that you can uh, check the flow rule so let's let me make flow rule is nothing but uh, your uh, epsilon 1 divided by sigma 1 dash is equal to epsilon 2 divided by sigma 2 dash is equal to epsilon 3 divided by sigma 3 dash is equal to d lambda that is what we studied no so you can calculate all these ratios and you can check all these things are almost same epsilon 1 is known sigma 1 dash is known here epsilon 2 is known sigma 2 dash is known here epsilon 3 is known sigma 3 dash is known here if you calculate it the ratio is going to remain same so let me say 4 rule is checked plastic work done there is a last equation so again we know that okay so work done per unit volume is nothing but uh, i am going to write sigma bar d epsilon bar integral of that okay integral of that uh, will give me my work done per unit volume isn't it so now the limit is decided by this fellow epsilon bar so actual equation is this equation is already given in the question for me correct 600 into 0 0.008 plus epsilon bar power 0 0.22 is already given i am just substituting it here and the limit is decided by this differential epsilon bar epsilon bar the limit is maximum limit is 0 0.218 which i calculated it here so as per the question when you convert a square element to rectangular element the maximum effective strain that i am going to get is 0 0.218 up to that i have deformed so which is becoming my upper limit here 0 0.218 i am going to substitute here so you can integrate it and finally, you will be able to find out work done per unit volume is 78.77 10 power 6 joule per meter cube. Okay. And volume can be found out. Instantaneous volume can be found out, right? Instantaneous volume is nothing but uh, the previous one. What is instantaneous volume? 6.5 into 9.4 into 0 0.838 mm cube. Right. So, if you multiply that uh, okay, with this, with this, okay. so then you will get uh, work done which is nothing but 4.03 joules okay so if this form of the equation is going to be different then naturally you are going to get a different 
uh, you know work done assuming that let us say 0 0.008 is not given 600 epsilon power 0 0.22 then there will be some slight change in the work done okay so this is the root this root has to be carefully uh, you know maintained okay this root is, has to be carefully maintained so you get all this from alpha you get this uh, from alpha you want to get sigma 1 sigma 1 2 then you should know sigma bar if sigma bar is to be obtained then you should get epsilon bar the epsilon bar depends on these fellows epsilon 1 2 and 3 okay then once you get uh, sigma bar you will get uh, sigma 1 using alpha if alpha is known you can get uh, sigma 2 if sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma 3 all are known to me from this I can get sigma h if sigma h is known to me I can get sigma 1 dash sigma 2 dash and sigma 3 dash okay and the work done is a separate work done per unit volume is a separate which is given by sigma bar the integral sigma bar d epsilon bar okay so this is an important problem which is going to relate several things which you have studied okay and it is very practical in nature so this is one element in the sheet you can get the situation now okay so the question is a square element in an undeformed sheet okay an element let us say you take a sheet of let us say you know 50 mm by 50 mm okay in that okay or you can take 100 mm by 100 mm or a circular sheet of let us say 200 mm diameter in that there is a small element which is going this type of deformation and there are many such 100 different elements let us say rectangles each one will deform differently to make a component in all that location this all are going to change you can imagine like that okay let us solve uh, one more problem okay in this uh, which also uh, you know uh, is going to use all these equations that we derive so the question is very simple compare two plane stress deformation process so it is said so you said plane stress deformation process sigma 3 is 0 as we studied for a sample of high strength low alloy steel there is a steel like this okay of 1 mm sheet thickness okay there is a steel sheet of 1 mm thickness which is undergoing plane stress deformation but there are two cases a case is biaxial tension in which a strain ratio of 1 is maintained and in another one which is called as shear or drawing strain path where the strain ratio is minus 1 that is maintained okay one is a balanced biaxial tension where your beta that is strain ratio is maintained as 1 other one is your shear part wherein beta is equal to minus 1 is maintained okay i think now uh, you can go back to that strain diagram which we have drawn in the previous section and see where this beta is going to fit okay so where this beta is going to get fit okay so i don't have that uh, diagram here i think you can go back and check it okay anyway so now the square element whose sides are aligned with the principal directions is initially 10 by 10 okay so again you take a square element which are aligned along one direction and two direction in this way and both are 10 by 10 okay and uh, one side is extended to 12 mm okay and one side is uh, extended to 12 mm okay and the material properties are described by this equation sorry this is sigma bar sigma bar is equal to 850 epsilon bar power 0 0.12 the same simple power law mpa okay so now what you need to do is you need to compare these two process okay same sheet that is this steel sheet of 1 mm 2 is deformed in two different ways one is biaxial tension okay where strain ratio is 1 the other one is shear or drawing wherein you say beta is equal to minus 1 okay you have to compare these two by finding out effective strains effective stresses principal strains and principal stresses and finally sheet thickness this all has to be found out okay so now the standard route which you followed before dimensions are given okay so naturally you have to find these three first okay epsilon 1 2 and 3 so how am i going to find out so epsilon 1 is ln of 12 by 10 isn't it so 12 divided by 10 will give me my one direction strain that is epsilon 1 okay so which is going to be same 0 0.182 and 0 0.182 uh, this is beta is equal to 1 uh, this is a biaxial testing and this is a shear okay so now if i want to find epsilon 2 i know beta is into epsilon 1 so beta is going to be 1 here minus 1 here so this becomes 0 0.182 this becomes minus 0 0.182 right so if i know epsilon 1 and 2 i can get epsilon 3 right as a equal to minus of 1 plus beta and epsilon 1 
correct? Or I can get epsilon 1 plus 2 plus 3 is equal to 0, either way I can find out. So, I know beta here, I know epsilon 1, so I know epsilon 3 as minus 0 0.365 and it has 0. This point should be noted here, okay. There is a previous problem where thickness has increased, okay. In this problem, if you see in shear beta is equal to minus 1, if you deform it, thickness will remain same. That is why your thickness strain is going to be 0. Thickness strain is going to be 0 means what? Thickness remains same. Epsilon 3 is equal to ln of T by T naught, okay. And that is same means, uh, 0 means T and T naught are going to be same. Okay, so, that means thickness is not reducing. So, there is no thickness strain here. That should be noted here. Here thickness strain is minus. Okay, so, that means thickness has gone down. Let us say now these three uh, strains are found out. Now, you got uh, your you want to get epsilon bar. Okay, this epsilon bar derivation we already done today. Square root of 4 by 3 into 1 plus beta plus beta square into epsilon 1. So, I have written this in terms of beta and epsilon 1. So, you can also write the previous uh, you know, uh, stage of this equation, square root of 2 by 3 into epsilon 1 square plus 2 square plus 3 square, that also can be utilized. So, everything is known to me, beta, I found out uh, beta is given here, 1 and minus 1 and then epsilon 1 is found out for both this and this. So, that will give me my epsilon bar which is 0 0.365 and 0 0.211. So, epsilon bar is known, next to root is to find sigma bar, sigma bar equation is provided, otherwise you cannot get sigma bar, sigma bar equation should be given. Okay, then just substitute epsilon bar here, epsilon bar here, you will get sigma bar. Okay, so you can also understand that you know, like because uh, deformation is happening in constant thickness, that means thickness strain is zero, you need a lesser effective stress to reach that level. Here, you need larger effective stress. Okay, and uh, one straightforward thing which you can find out beta, if it is known, alpha can be found out, it is 1 and minus 1. Using the Levy Meisel's flow rule is equation, you can use. Correct. So, if sigma bar is known, alpha is known, I can find sigma 1 which is nothing but my major principal stress, sigma bar divided by square root of 1 minus alpha plus alpha square where sigma bar is 723 divided by square root of 1 minus 1 plus 1. So, it will be 723 mega Pascal, okay, these all are in mega Pascal. Uh, effective stress this is in mega Pascal, this is also in mega Pascal and for this fellow if you put minus 1 here, minus 1 here and sigma bar is 662, then you will get a minus stress again mega Pascal as 723 and minus 382, right. So, thickness you can find out, directly you can find out. So, uh, how do you find thickness? Epsilon 3 is known, right. So, you can find uh, thickness, okay, from that uh, directly. This is what I was telling you. So, thickness is going to be 1.2 which is same as that of your initial thickness. So, you deform a sheet in pure shear or beta is equal to minus 1 or they call it as drawing strain path. So, you can deform the material, okay, up to a strain of epsilon bar is equal to 0 0.211, okay, by keeping thickness as 1.2 itself, okay, without much change in thickness. But here you see there is a significant change in sheet thickness, okay. So, so these are two important problems in this uh, section, in this module, okay. And, um, uh, so, we will start a new module in the next uh, class. Thank you.